Genesis chapter 3. I've entitled the message this morning, Cross Examination. Cross Examination. We'll be focusing our attention on verses 9 through 14 of Genesis chapter 3. There's an outline on the back of your worship guide if you'd like to use that to follow along this morning. Cross-examination, you might think we're talking about Calvary's cross, or if you have spent any time watching legal dramas or been involved in courts, you know that cross-examination is part of the legal proceedings. So what better way to focus our attention on courtroom than with a few dad jokes? A man sued an airline company after he lost his luggage. Sadly, he lost his case. Lawyers really take the fun out of everything. Even Santa comes with a clause. Who invented copper wire? Well, of course, it was two tax attorneys fighting over a penny. Eight vowels, 11 consonants, an exclamation mark, and a comma appeared in court today. They are due to be sentenced next week. What kind of underwear do lawyers wear? Of course, briefs. What is a personal injury lawyer's favorite dessert? A tort. Why did the golden retriever not make any money at his first law firm? Because he only worked on pro bono cases. <laughs> Last one, I promise. Why did the law student go to court wearing a shirt with no sleeves? Because he had the right to bear arms. And mercifully, we'll, we'll stop right there. When we think about what happens in a courtroom, though, what we're doing is confronting someone with evidence. What have they done? We're putting them on trial to determine whether they are guilty of the charges that have been presented or whether they are to be found innocent. The person who is coming before the judge will be confronted either with the reality of what they have done or will be able to make a case why they have not done what they have been accused of doing. And so it is what we find ourselves here with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are being confronted by their judge. In this case, it is God their creator. And as we work through, I think you, well, well, you aren't going to be able to make a case cr truly that, that, that they're sitting in a courtroom that he's put on his judge's robes, he has a gavel, there is still the model of God confronting them with the reality, with the accusation, and the asking the questions, revealing evidence, and getting them to acknowledge their guilt. How do they work through this? How do they respond when they are confronted with the evidence by their judge? And how will their judge rule? Genesis chapter 3, beginning verse 9, after they have been confronted here with the reality of disobeying God's command, it says in verse 9, Moses writes, The Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me be with me. She gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word. As we look at the text, what we are first confronted with is this scenario where the man and the woman are standing before God. They are standing before God, their divinely appointed judge. 
And he asks in the first question that we have in verse 9, where are you? Now some have said that's kind of an odd question to ask. Is, is if God is all-knowing, if he understands everything, there's not like there's a, they could get lost in a crowd or anything, how, why would he need to ask that question? But I think what he's actually doing is he's calling them. He's calling them to acknowledge what it is they have done. He is effectively laying before them the charge, and that is what you should be following along in your outline. As they stand before God, God, as they stand before their judge, this is effectively the arraignment. What have you been accused of, and how do you plead? God is beckoning them to come to the stand and to be evaluated. And it is a reminder that just as they have to answer, where are they? Here I am. Here is the case that has been put in front of you. Do you plead guilty or not guilty, whether they're formally saying those things or not? Friends, it is a reminder that just as the man and the woman stood before God, so will all of us need to do that one day. Hebrews 9.27 reminds us that it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes what? Judgment. Each one of us must stand before God to give an account for who we are and what we have done. John records this in Revelation chapter 20. In the great white throne judgment is what we often call this passage. And it says in verse 12, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And it reminds us that it's not just the people who are taken up who are alive at this point in time. It is all of the people. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. That's a pretty uncomfortable spectacle for us to consider. Because, again, a lot of times we realize that we're not perfect. But we don't like to have our past uncovered. So that's really the bane of social media. You know, what you did uh, on Facebook, sometimes you know, it stays on Facebook. Isn't it good that MySpace is no longer around anymore? Because think of all the embarrassing things that you used to do when those things were on. If somebody uncovers a Twitter archive uh, in 30 years, what are they going to think of their grandparents? And that's just the reality of how we portray ourselves in the public eye. People want to be able to erase some of those embarrassing details, some of those embarrassing expressions about themselves. But when we think about what John records here, books are open. It has been written down. It has been recorded. Every single thing that you have ever done will one day, though it is hidden now, be revealed. God is going to lay the charges in front of you just like he lays the charges here in front of Adam. Where are you? What is this thing you have done? Friend, God is going to call each one of us to be judged. How will you plead? How are you prepared to make a case for yourself? Because not only is God going to call you to the bench to be evaluated, he's going to put the evidence out on display. Here he asks Adam and Eve questions to gather and expose the evidence. Look in verse 11 again. Adam says, as God asks, who told you that you were naked? And then he asks, have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Later on in verse 13, he asks the woman the same question. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? and puts these questions in front of them. They are meant to be confrontational 
yes, but they are also meant to expose the truth. It is giving an opportunity for acknowledgement of the sin and for confession and repentance to take place. But that is not legitimately how they answer. They could have said, yes, God, I know you told me not to eat, but we did. And we feel horrible. We are so sorry. But notice how they respond instead. Adam, when he says, who told you you were naked? Who have you eaten of the tree? Have you done these things? This is how Adam answers. The man said, verse 12, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. So does he answer the question, did you eat of the tree? He says, yes, I ate. But it's not really my fault. It's her fault. She gave it to me. I wouldn't have eaten it if she hadn't given it to me. And you know what, God? Everything was perfect before you brought her here. It's her fault, and you gave her to me. So really, God, this is all on you. And not saying this to be funny, that's what he's doing to justify himself. I had no choice. I got backed into a corner. I'm a victim of circumstances. I really had no other option. He's trying to absolve himself of the guilt. I did it, yes, but. And what we see here is not really acknowledgement. It's not really confession. It's blame shifting. It's trying to put it on somebody else. It's, I had extenuating circumstances. So I'm blaming her, and God, I'm blaming you. This is what one commentary, Victor Hamilton, says on this. The rationaliza- through rationalization, the criminal becomes the victim, and it is God and the woman who emerge as the real instigators in this scenario. Adam plays up their contribution in his demise and downplays his own part. By postponing his own involvement until the last word in the verse, Adam attempts to minimize his part in the sin. He completely ignores the first question. Who told you you were naked? I'm exposed. I'm there in the open. Everything is open, not hidden. And I feel the weight of that. I feel the shame of it. And God, I'm not, I can't even deal with that. I'm just going to focus on this second thing and try to distract you from the reality of the consequences of my sin. God poses a similar question to Eve, to the woman. Then the Lord God, verse 13, says to the woman, what is this that you have done? And while her explanation isn't maybe as detailed or as thoughtful as Adam's, she says, point blank, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So yes, I did eat, but it's the snake's fault. He manipulated me. I had no choice. I was uh, condoned into doing this. I was, I was led into this. I was deceived. I was seduced. The questions that God asks should allow for ownership, repentance, confession, but instead, how do Adam and Eve res- respond? They respond in panic. They respond in fear. Because again, like we talked about last week, the child with his hand in the cookie jar, what's he doing? He's wiping the crumbs off his face. He's got evidence all over. But no, I, Bob, I didn't know. I, 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 no, I, I, and they try to cover up what it is they have done. And they come up, we as people, as human beings, are overwhelmed. We try to create our own solutions. Friend, even as we see the futility of how Adam and Eve respond here, how do we respond when we are confronted with the reality of our own sin? Do we tend to take responsibility or do we tend to explain it away, to rationalize and make excuses, to put the blame on others? Should we? Proverbs 28, verse 13. Again, we quoted this last week, but it reminds us, whoever conceals his transgressions will not 
prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. God delights in mercy, even as he has the evidence of who we are and what we have done. Even here with Adam and Eve, though there are consequences looming, he is delighting in the opportunity that he has to allow them to confess. Though they do not take him up on it, he is giving them the opportunity to acknowledge. But now that the evidence has been there, that we've seen that they're blame shifting, we've seen how they are approaching this, and yet they do ultimately have to admit, I ate of the fruit. You said not to, but that's what I did. God renders his verdict. It is an unspoken verdict, but it is obvious. There is no denying of their guilt. What is this you have done? I ate. I ate. God has put it on exposure. They have made their confession. There is the acknowledgement. The law has been broken. Paul says in Romans chapter 3 in verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped. And listen to this for our purposes here. The whole world may be held accountable. As King James, I think, says the whole world may be found guilty before God. God made this law. You will not eat. You will die. And they have broken the law. They will be held accountable. Friend, it's no different for you and me. That verse, if we would continue to read, will go on to say, all have sinned, that chapter in Romans chapter 3, all fall short of God's glory. None of us are innocent. All of us are guilty. Maybe not of every potential sin there ever would be, or to the extent that sin could be committed, but all of us have broken God's law. All of us have either lied, we have allowed our desires to control us, we have been selfish, we have been proud, we have been boastful, we have been disobedient. The reality is, all of us fit this category. All of us can get this verdict that God has pronounced upon Adam and Eve, and he pronounces upon us as well. So what are the consequences? What is God's sentence? What we see here is in verse 14. This got to have been very intimidating as they're listening. Because first, God does not start by condemning Adam and Eve. He starts with the reality of giving consequences to the serpent. Because you have done this, verse 14, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. So, what we don't know from the text, there's been a lot of speculation on this, is what did the serpent look like before this? He's obviously some, a creature who must have been attractive. He doesn't immediately uh, recoil. Eve doesn't recoil when she sees him. They have a conversation. Uh, some speculate maybe they, they had arms and legs. Maybe it looked something more like a, some kind of a beautiful lizard or something. We, we really don't know. But what we can derive from the text is whatever happens here at this point, there is some kind of an alteration. There's some kind of a horrifying change. And Adam and Eve must have looked at the, at the serpent when this curse is delivered from God, this consequence, and said, oh no, if that's what the serpent gets, what's in store for me? God has already said, in the day that you eat of it, you will die. And they have no concept, really, yet of what death means. But it doesn't sound good. And there has to be this feeling in the pit of their stomach of horror. What do I have coming? But notice, even as we stop here, even as you scan ahead to the end of the chapter, there are consequences, but the consequences aren't as severe as we might think. Does God make separation? Does God cast them out of the garden? He 
Yes. Do they physically die? If you continue to read the genealogies, Adam and Eve live for literally centuries afterwards. Do they die physically? Ultimately, yes. But it's not something that happens just like that. Which I'm going to remind you, friends, is itself a testimony to God's mercy. We can talk all we want to about the realities of what death meant. And yes, it did mean a broken fellowship, a ceasing of the relationship they had. There is distance that's been created, a gap that needs to be bridged by Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross, which we remember this morning. But the reality is as well that that is a testimony to God making a promise. that There could be that. That the serpent's head would be bruised by the seed of the woman. That there is hope still coming. And God, even in His condemnation of Adam and Eve, is demonstrating Himself to be a God of grace and mercy. And friend, that is where our hope is. Even though there is a sentence delivered to the serpent, there is ultimately going to be consequences to Adam and Eve. Our hope, as just as their hope would be, will be to look to God and appeal for mercy. Look to Him and appeal for mercy. That begins by the righteous person realizing that, yes, I am a sinner. And I need only what God can provide. Daniel, who by all accounts is a righteous man, he's one of the pinnacles of people who we see as faithful and examples of moral upstanding purity. What does he pray in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 9? To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. And why do we need that mercy and forgiveness? Daniel says, we have rebelled against him. Part of what makes a good person a really good person is not because they never do anything wrong, it's because they realize how much wrong they've done, how much they need God's forgiveness. They take the time to examine their hearts, to realize how they are going against God's character, how they are rebelling against God's expectations, and seeking to restore that relationship. The hardened criminal, like we talked about last week, the one who is really guilty is also the one who the sin doesn't really bother him anymore. Remember like the example we talked about of the the registered sex offender last week? Why don't you want them working in your children's ministry? Why don't you want them babysitting? Because they know it's wrong, but they've forgotten that that should feel bad. They've been desensitized. They aren't confessing and acknowledging. They aren't overwhelmed. they, They have seared that conscience, that prick of the heart. And friend, that's what becomes so easy when we repeat patterns of sinful behavior. It becomes easier and easier to tell the lie, to justify our angry responses. Because I did that, but I wouldn't have done that if the kids had picked up the room or if that person hadn't cut me off in traffic. Those are the kinds of things that we sometimes say to justify our own lack of self-control, our pride and arrogance, our being slaves to our passions and desires, but saying, who is this going to hurt? It's just an image on my phone. It's not hurting anybody else. It's not doing any harm. I'm getting some enjoyment out of it. What does it bother anyone else? And we make the excuses. We put the blame. I, I wouldn't... Yeah, I, I, I know, but everybody has access and it's free. How can I help myself? And we don't take the responsibility we really need. It has to start with that reality. I have rebelled against you, God. 
That's what David said in the passage that we read before communion. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. What happens when we do that? Paul says in Romans 10 verse 9, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The pastor doesn't want to talk anything about sin. But Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. And what did Jesus do? Jesus died. Why did he die? For our sins. To understand who Jesus is, is not just to understand he's a God, he's a good guy, he healed the sick, and he supplied money for the poor, and and he's doing all this good stuff. That's a good guy. I want to be like him. No. It's realizing that he came to save sinners. And I'm one of them. I need him because I am a sinner. And Jesus is a great Savior. When we confess, friends, confessing Jesus, but it's confessing that we need him because we deserve death for what we have done. James assures us of this, though, that when we confess Jesus, when we look to him for forgiveness, when we draw near to God, James 4 4 and verse 8, He will draw near to you. So what must we do? Cleanse our hands, sinners. Purify your hearts. Realize that God has supplied Jesus to make that possible. That's not just to the unconverted. That's to all of us who keep coming back to the table, remembering what Jesus has done. Because, as the hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We each have a tendency, even those of us who put faith and trust in Jesus Christ, to get drugged back into the old ways. We need to find confession. We need to be people who are repenting. We need to hear that gospel message for ourselves time and again. Not because we keep losing our salvation, but because we keep falling back into the old habits. Allow God to change you, friend, with His truth. Take ownership, take responsibility, and then seek His forgiveness. Seek God's pardon. Isaiah 55 and verse 7 reminds us, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Unless you think that's just an Old Testament concept, that's true in the New as well. Hebrews 8 verse 12, God says, I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When we confess our sins, he will forgive. Paul reminds Titus in Titus 3 and verse 5 that God's righteousness, God's mercy, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but it's because of God's own mercy. By the washing of regeneration, born again Christians that have been changed, the renewal of the Holy Spirit, helping you to do what you could not do before. Because He indwells your hearts. He has empowered your life, and He has helped you to be something different than the wicked, rotten, lifeless sinner you once were. He has given you life. And how are you going to take that? Are you going to try to justify yourself? Or are you going to acknowledge, this is who I am. But Jesus Christ has made all the difference. He's God. I'm not. He loved me. I belong to Him. And I need to admit who I am so that He can do what He wants to through me. How do you plead in God's courtroom? How do you attempt to justify your actions, friend? Do you see 
that you are a sinner in need of the Savior that God has provided through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that that continues even now. It's not just that I'm going to heaven. I don't need to worry about that anymore. But I continue to need His grace and forgiveness. Friends, when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But as John also reminds us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves truth is not in us. Don't deceive yourself. Don't blame it on anything or anyone else. Confess your sins. and Find mercy at the cross because we are in God's courtroom and he has given us the best possible lawyer, the best possible advocate we could ever have, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness that we have through Jesus' death on the cross. Before your throne, you do not see any longer what we have done and who we are, but those of us who have confessed and turned to Jesus now be clothed in his righteousness. His life covers our sins. His blood has purchased our pardon. So now, no longer will you see who we are or what we have done you will see us clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for that hope. We thank you for that confidence we can have, not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. We pray this in his name. Amen.